everyone, welcome to another Vintage Space tour of a museum. I am here in lovely Hutchinson, Kansas today at the Kansas Cosmosphere. You guys who have been out here have told me I have to get out here. I've been trying to get here for ages and I finally gave a talk at a conference that allowed me to sneak away for a day before I dump on a flight um, and actually visit the museum. So I'm going to take you guys through the tour of the space stuff and highlight some of the really incredible stuff that is here. It's actually an amazing museum, which it kind of blows my mind that it's in Kansas because when you think space you don't think Kansas but I wanted to start with what's directly behind me because guys this is awesome so this is an SR-71 that has flown and you can touch it <laughs> this is awesome this is wild it's um it's impossible to like capture the scale um and how big it feels but like you walk into the museum and there is just an SR-71 directly in your face um it's awesome so on that really good starting note Let's go check out all of their amazing space artifacts that they have because this really is an incredible collection that's worth traveling for. All right, so first up, let's see if this is gonna work, yeah. All right, so first up, this is one of the coolest things I think that is in this museum. They actually have a V2, we'll pan up so you guys can see it. So they actually have a V2. Now this isn't obviously not one that was flown, but this is actually a, uh, a replica that was made from parts that were recovered from Germany. So, and they have the, the absolutely beautifully horrifying um, prisoner who is building the V2. So I've talked about the V2 a lot before. Um, they've, I've got videos, I've got links in the description if you guys want to learn more from previous videos. But the V2 was the German, um, the German rocket that Werner von Braun and Walter Dornberger and that whole crew built for the German army. And its use was then strongholded by the SS to use it as an offensive weapon. And it was the, the SS who made the first, um, the call to actually launch it the first time. And it was really like, Hitler didn't love the V2. He didn't love rockets. Um, he wasn't super excited at the prospect of actually having a rocket as a weapon. Ooh, I walked into a wall. Um, he couldn't really see the value in it. Even when, and I'm gonna try to show you guys the length of it here. Um, even when um, he went to, to Panamunda, where it was built in the northern, northern, German, northern Germany, he saw one taken apart to actually see the insides and he still wasn't super impressed by it. It wasn't until um, the, the Allies raided Panamunda and tried to bomb it with the goal of taking out all of the scientists in um, August 17th of 1943 that Hitler realized that this weapon was scaring the Allies and maybe it was something worth putting all of his money and, and effort into. So it was only in late 1943 that the V2 program, well the, the A4 program as it was called before it was a vengeance weapon, so that was when the production of the V2 moved to Mittel work in the middle of Germany so it would be less coastal and less vulnerable to attack by allies. And this was also when it started to be built by um, prisoners of war and concentration camp laborers. The camp that was near Mittel work was called Dora and it was by all accounts the most horrifying conditions of any concentration camp. Um, and we've got a really cool thing at the end. I'm gonna try not to hit the other pole and show you guys that it's actually open on the end. So you can actually see the inner workings of the rocket engine of the V2. So the V2 was first launched in, um, date off the top of my head escapes me, but 1944, um, I wanna say September, August. Um, and it was, it was launched successfully for the Germans, not so much for the Allies. It did kill a fair number of people, but far more people were actually killed building the V2 with slave labor um, than were killed by, by being bombed with it. So of course, as we go through the story, um, the V2 was like the standout technology of the Second World War, right? Everyone wanted to get their hands on all of this good stuff right up here. Um, and also the brains that made the good stuff form of Warner von Braun. So the Soviets and the Americans wanted, wanted it, and as we know, sorry, spoiler alert if you don't know, um, Werner von Braun wanted to work with the Americans, not exchanging one terrible dictatorship for another and go to the Soviet Union. So he surrendered successfully to the Americans, but the Soviets also got a handful of V2 engineers. So the story continues. So one thing I will say about the Cosmosphere, they're not shying away from the V2, oh you can sort of see it better here, they're not shying away from the V2's Nazi past because there are swastikas everywhere in this room to really drive home the fact that it was the Nazi war weapon. So it's weird, 
It's very, very interesting. I've actually seen V2s in museums. The Smithsonian has one, um, but you don't see them with Nazi flags around them all the time. So, yeah, you know where it came from. <sighs> so you know where the V2 came from, but you also know where it went. There's a really interesting map right behind me on the wall here that actually shows every um, red dot is a V1 and every green dot is a V2. So you can actually see um, some of the impact sites from the V2. So as we know, the story of the V2 kind of comes to a head when um, the Soviets and the Americans were both trying to get their hands on the scientists so they could build their own versions and have their own offensive weapons. Now, it does ultimately, as we know, the Cold War comes down to a war of ideologies. And there's this one part of this museum that for some reason just makes me, I just think this is the best visualization. So on the one side is a statue of Lenin that was in Belarus. This is a, a real statue that's been on display for years. And he is staring down Uncle Sam, the idealistic American. Um, yep, this is great. And then behind them, we have the two rocket geniuses. We've got Sergei Korolev on one side and Werner von Braun on the other. So we, we start to see the division of the two sides of the space race right now. While Werner von Braun is working on the Redstone IRBM, he of course wants to put something into orbit. He understands that it's going to be a huge psychological victory for the first nation to put something into space, even if it's really small. So he had earmarked two Redstones, RS-27 and RS-29, that could take uh, spacecraft, tiny little satellites, into orbit. And there was even a launch in September of 1956 where if the fourth stage had been active and not just filled with sand as ballast, it could have put a satellite into orbit. And actually, um, someone from the Army, I think it might have been General Madera's actually, was sent down to make sure that the fourth stage wasn't live, to make sure he wasn't sneaking a satellite up. And of course, as we know, Von Braun was right. He was right that the first satellite was a huge psychological victory because the Soviet Union beat the US to the punch on October 4th of 1957 with this. So this is Sputnik, as you can tell. But what's super cool about this one is that this is actually an engineering mock-up. So Khrushchev and Korolev both actually touched this model. Let's look at it again. So there is a full-scale model of Sputnik. Um, what I sort of didn't notice or didn't think about seeing it in pictures, look at how long those antenna are. They just keep on going. That is a very long antenna for a super tiny little ball. But this was actually built as the engineering double in the Soviet Union and somehow it's ended up at the Kansas Cosmosphere. So that's kind of awesome. And then, of course, as we know, the Soviet Union followed that up with Sputnik 2. So here is a mock-up of Sputnik 2. This is not the, the, as, I don't think this is as fancy a, uh, an engineering double, but you can see, see if you can get in there, you can see the model of Leica in there. So that's sad. Leica, of course, did not return to Earth nor have a very great flight. But um, yeah, so these are the first two um, really big embarrassments as the display is wont to hammer home. I think this is really funny. Let's see if I can show it. So Sputnik 2, oh no, that's the wrong side. Sputnik 2, here we are, is labeled embarrassment number two. So Sputnik 1 is labeled embarrassment number one in this museum, which I actually think is really, really funny. And then over here, I'm just gonna spin us around, we have um, embarrassment number three in the form of Vanguard. So Sputnik, we just saw it's pretty big. As we know, Vanguard is tiny. This is an engineering double of the, the Vanguard satellite. So this was the famous uh, Flopnik slash Stayputnik, uh, Spatnik, any other joke term. Uh, Puffnik was another one. So this was the one that the, the Navy launched on their, the, the American made homegrown Vanguard rocket. Actually, here's the footage that I guess I can just sneak into the video. But um, this was the, this was the, um, this was the launch that got you know, a few inches off the ground and then failed and then landed back on the launch pad and exploded. And because Eisenhower had actually said that this test is actually the TV3 test launch, he had said that it would be the first satellite shot. Um, the whole thing was broadcast live. So the entire country got to watch their, its satellite attempt fail in a giant, blaze of glory and this was the teeny tiny satellite. So then let's just continue the story because it's all in the same hallway. So Von Brown knew he had no faith in the Navy's ability to actually make the Vanguard work. He didn't think it was a great system. He knew that his Redstone was ready to go and would be able to actually launch something. So he was given clearance in the days after um, after the Vanguard failure, let's fix the lighting here, after the Vanguard failure, he was given 
60 days to get his version up, his satellite offering up. Um, of course, the, the challenge was, right, no one really wanted to give the first American satellite shot to an ex-Nazi, but they did, and it worked. So on uh, January 31st, 58, slash February 1st, uh, depending on time zone, uh, here is a model of Explorer 1. It's backlit, so it's a bit hard to see. Let's see if I can, well, here it is. Here's the model of Explorer 1. So it is bigger than, than Vanguard, but it's still not a massive satellite. But that is America's first satellite. So it was really with the launch of Explorer 1 and 58 that things started to become even in the space race, not by a long shot. So as we know, the next step was putting men into orbit. And the museum takes us right into that story. So this is something neat that I've never actually seen and I thought this was a super cool visualization because again, we don't necessarily see the things you read about. So we know that Werner von Braun and his team ended up in um, White Sands, New Mexico, working on the V2s and then eventually with the start of the Korean War, they were, they were sort of thawed off their waiting period as it were. They were sort of talked about being put on ice. Um, they were, they left, went to Mexico, re-entered the country to officially begin, um, begin the process of becoming American citizens and then they all moved to the Redstone Arsenal what became the Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama, to build this. This is the Redstone Warhead. This was actually a, a mock-up, so we can kind of see the inside, how much stuff is going on in here. Um, this is the Warhead, and I'm just gonna walk along it, because I sort of um, didn't realize it was gonna be that big. So yeah, this was what was designed to go on the Redstone. Um, when they were building it as an offensive weapon, as an IRBM, an inter intermediate range ballistic missile. Um, of course, then as we know, it was then modified to carry a Mercury spacecraft, which I believe is just around the corner. All right, so super dark room, but this is kind of neat and I wanted to show you guys because I did not expect this to be at the Kansas Cosmosphere. Um, but uh, so there's a, an exhibit as you're going through the early space race, as we know, it was a war of ideologies, right? The Cold, the cold War is a war of ideologies. The space race was an incarnation of that. And they have this beautiful display right here. So behind me is a piece of the German wall. So this was the wall that split Germany in half, right? And then there's a statue of Kennedy looking super chill, staring at a yelling Khrushchev. So the Soviets and Americans are both trying to build rockets and spacecraft to put people into space before the other one because race to be first means you're best. So as we know, Yuri Gagarin got there first and they have at this museum a genuine Vostok spacecraft, which unfortunately has everything reflected in it. So it's kind of hard to see, but if you notice, Right up here, there is actually a skull and crossbones painted in it. So this is an actual flown Vostok. This was not launched, uh, this is obviously not the one that Gagarin flew. This was launched in the test before he flew, which I think means that it might be the one that Ivan Ivanovich flew, which if you guys remember from my video, he was the humanoid dummy stuffed with mice and other living things and had a, a piped in sound of a chorus singing and also a recipe for beet soup that he would broadcast so they could test the communication system. So it's possible if this, if I'm right, because it doesn't actually say anything about Ivanovich um, on these panels, but it might be that this was the one that launched Ivan Ivanovich before Yuri Gagarin. So the Soviet Union got the first man in space, as we know, with Yuri Gagarin, but that didn't mean NASA was not going to keep going with Mercury. And of course, behind us, we have a mock-up of a Mercury spacecraft. This was the first to put humans in Americans into space. Um, the first two, of course, suborbital and then orbital. And I am touching this because it is not a real spacecraft. So I think some of you guys probably know that the Kansas Cosmosphere is home to Liberty Bell 7, which was Gus Grissom's spacecraft that sunk after his mission in 1961 and was recovered from the bottom of the Atlantic three miles deep in 1999. So obviously everybody wants to look at Liberty Bell 7. Um, so it's on tour right now. So I have not, that's still a, a capsule I haven't seen. So this is a mock-up of uh, Freedom 7, so that's here. So uh, moving on to the more um, awesome stuff they have. So. Right after Vostok and Mercury, things had to get a little bit bigger and better. And um, up next for the Soviets was Voskhod. So Voskhod, I will turn around, is right behind me. So you can kind of see here's the here's the the sort of service module equivalent. Um, here's the actual manned module and extending out is, oh, it's so dark in here. I'm so sorry guys, it's really hard to see, but extending out of here is actually the airlock 
that Alexei Leonov used when he did the first spacewalk in 1965. So the Voskhod was actually just a modified Vostok to hold more people. Um, and as we know, NASA did something a little bit different when it did its second generation spacecraft. Rather than just build a, well, they basically built a bigger Mercury, but it was much more capable. And we have, as you guys know, my favorite, here's Gemini, it's Gemini 10. So this was John Young and Mike Collins. Um, second to third to last, rather, uh, Gemini mission. So let's see if you can get, can't totally get to show you guys the inside of it. But um, here's the hatch, so you can actually see how complicated it was and actually see how big an opening there was um, to do EVAs. So you can see the comparison. So Vostok, or Voskhod rather, couldn't be fully depressurized, hence the airlock to actually get the astronaut out. For Gemini, they just depressurized the whole thing and just opened the door. Um, so this is, of course, it's behind glass. I am touching the glass. Um, I probably shouldn't even touch the glass. but. Um, this is the real flight article. This was actually a Gemini that has flown in space. Um, so that's always fun to see in Kansas. <laughs> I just noticed this, so we're gonna show it. This is the handlebar that Ed White used to close the hatch on the first spacewalk on Gemini 4 in 1965. Alrighty, so the, the crux of the museum and we're going through sort of the history of manned space flight tour. Um, I don't know if you guys can hear, they're piping in mission audio from Apollo 17. Um, but is the Apollo room, and there is so much in here, I, yeah, I can't show you everything, but I'm going to try. So first up, let's see if I can get a shot of this. It's on the ceiling, there is a massive cutaway, um, like a model that's clear of the Saturn V, so you can actually see what's going on inside it, um, which is super neat. I love these kinds of models that actually let you see kind of what is happening inside the rocket. Um, there's a couple of really cool things too. Um, I just did a video about this recently, I'll put the link up, but here's the Saturn V cue ball. It's the cue ball that actually measured dynamic pressure and air pressure as the rocket was launching to know if it had to abort, um, how to do it safely so that the crew would not like plunk down somewhere scary or roll over in flight. Um, proper video explains more things about that. Um, and here's something that I've actually never known anything about, so I will be looking into this. Um, the auxiliary propulsion system. So here is one of the auxiliary propulsion system rockets um, that was on the Saturn V. So it looks like it was on the S4B stage um, and was one of like the ollage motors. So I'm gonna look into what exactly the auxiliary propulsion system did. And the little placard here mentions that there were 83 com like total engines on a Saturn V. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have to go through and figure out what all of those 83 engines are. Okay. So I can't hide this because it's massive and behind me, but here's the lunar module. Um, all right. So this obviously never went to the moon. Um, the lunar modules did not come back from the moon, um, but this was a training mock-up. So astronauts did actually use this when they were training for the moon. Um, I'm gonna try to show you as best I can. It's, it's bigger than you think. I mean, you see pictures, you see pictures of men inside it, you know how big it is, sort of, but it feels really big um, and really impressive. Like I, I, I'm not gonna get picked out. I'm not gonna reach out and touch it, <laughs> but um, it's massive. Like it feels much more substantial. Like we talk about how, you know, the gold foil and in some places um, it's only, you know, a few millimeters thick that you can put your foot through it if you're not careful. It feels a lot more impressive standing in front of this one and actually looking at how much like heft it has than you would almost imagine it would be. So there's also a uh, lunar lunar rover here. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, to be totally honest, if this one was used in training or if it was just a mock-up, but um, does give you a sense of how tiny it was. That thing can obviously be folded into the storage compartment of this thing. Oh, I hear children. Okay, so there's a couple other things I need to show you guys here. Um, of course, most cool space museums like this have a moon rock, so here is an Apollo 11 sample rock. Um, you can see the little blinking light. I'm afraid to even get too close to it lest I set off an alarm. But this is like a substantial piece of the moon. All right, so when you think Kansas Cosmosphere, this is why I was super excited to come to this museum in the first place. Um, there is one piece de resistance that lives in this museum and I'm super excited that it's not on loan anywhere so I got to see it because Odyssey is here. <laughs> um, the command module from Apollo 13 lives at the Kansas Cosmosphere. So here it is. It's it's beautifully presented. I can't totally show you what it looks like because it's so, it's quite dark in here and everything's lit really beautifully. Oh my God, the light inside is flashing. 
the light inside. So you, you can actually look inside. There's a couple of mock-up astronauts in here, get a sense of it. And um, this is just reminding me of that scene in Apollo 13 when they're powering up the command module and the lights flickering because they're trying to conserve all their power. Um, this is eerie. This is really, really neat. I kind of love this right now. But it's, I mean, if you've never seen a command module in person, oh, and I can show you guys maybe if it's, if it's not too dark. I uh, can't totally see it, but the hatch is separate right here. You can actually see the workings of the Block 2 hatch. Um, it's beautiful. I mean, if you've never seen a command module in person, they're, you know that they're not massive, but they still feel pretty big, which is actually really neat. Um, I'll see if I can swing around and give you guys a quick look at the heat shield. Um, and there's, of course, all the uh, information about the mission and everything here. So we've got all the stuff down here, but here's Apollo 13's heat shield. Oh and a fuel cell is behind me, as is reflected in the glass. Let's turn around and show you that. Here's an Apollo fuel cell. Um, you can't totally see it because of the reflections, but this, this would be what powered these service modules and, of course, what caused some problems <laughs> on, on 13. So there's a couple more really neat things I want to walk through in this little Apollo room with you guys. Um, so we have an Apollo uh, lunar module trainer. So this was a real trainer that they did use. Um, I'll see if I can show you guys the inside of it. Um, sort of, it's really, really hard to see. It's easier to see when you can put your face up against the glass, unfortunately. But it does give you a sense of just how tiny the lunar module was. Um, even this trainer looks a little bit claustrophobic. Um, and then they have one really, really awesome piece here that I had no idea would be in a museum. I don't know why I didn't think about this, but we are walking into the Apollo White Room. Um, so this was, I'll turn around so you can actually see it, this was where the astronauts, so you can tell the shape is like the command module. So this is where the hatch would be, so astronauts would grab onto the bars and lift themselves into the spacecraft and we'll see if I can can show you but I'll take a picture of it and put it up so and right above the the top bar up here right up here um, it's signed by Gunter Vent the pad leader so this is just a really neat like piece of history that exists in this museum and it's really beautifully presented and on the other side we have the other side of the white room that switches and dials and everything um i'll do a video about the white room because now that i think about it i've never done one but this is a super cool place to stand um just knowing sort of what happened in this space even though it is very far away from uh from kennedy right now but yeah, this is a neat little, I love when they have exhibits like this that like the ceiling is here and everything so you actually get a sense of the physical space as opposed to just seeing a picture or seeing a piece of it. Um, it's really, it's quite something. This is the Apollo room that sort of the museum funnels you through to the end of. It's absolutely astounding. Okay, there is a whole little exhibit about photography and lunar and space photography and it's not going to show up beautifully in this video, I don't think, but I had to show you guys or attempt to show you guys. So I think, I believe we're looking at Hasselblads or pieces of the Hasselblad cameras that were brought back from various missions and they're all signed by the astronauts that use them. So we've got Wally Shira, um, that looks like Jim Lovell, um, Rusty Schweikart. Uh, Tom Stafford, Buzz Aldrin, Dick Gordon. No, that's Jim Lovell. That's also Jim Lovell. So there are two Jim Levels. Uh, Ed Mitchell, Dave Scott, Charlie Duke, and Gene Cernan. So all these things are here. I had no, I didn't know this is here. This is like awesome. And then behind me on the other wall, there's a whole other, um, yeah, there's a whole other thing of like a displays of all the different cameras that they use with all the pictures. It's really hard to see in the video, but if you can get here, it's awesome. <laughs> All right, so I just found this wall of amazing Apollo artifacts. I'm super backlit, apologies. But then I saw something that I had to show, um, show you guys in a video, so I know you're gonna notice it. So here is a disc key um, that was flown on Apollo 12 with Pete Conrad. Guys, Pete Conrad, real Pete Conrad, touch that. Oh, I love Pete Conrad. Um, but here is the survival kit flown on Apollo 8. Look at the size of that knife. Look at the knife that was part of that survival kit. That thing is massive. I've never actually dug into what was involved in the survival kits and where they were stored, but that's a knife. Yeah, that is a serious knife. Also, I'll point out, because I have the video on, um, you can sort of see it, that little like goobery looking thing up there. That is an earpiece worn by Ron Evans on Apollo 14. So yeah, that's in here. All right, so the last thing on, as you kind of walk through the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo um, 
whole story. The last thing you get to, as you can see behind me, is Apollo Soyuz. So this is obviously a training mock-up. Um, I think. I think both of them were actually training mock-ups, if I remember the tour from yesterday correctly. Um, but here it is, it's, it's uh, really hard to get into, sh into a single shot, but I'll walk along so you guys can see a little bit more about it. It's also tough to see because it's set against black and the, uh, the docking unit is black. Um, so we'll just come over here and show you guys the Soyuz half. Of course, the Soyuz is still the same spacecraft that the Soviets flew, have been flying, and Russia now flies since 1967. So I just want to uh, relay the quick story of the docking adapter right here, this black bit in the middle. See if I can get a proper shot of it. Um, so uh, I've heard the weird story that people, and I, I just kind of want to tell this in case this is a story that people actually think is real. So the... Right, when you have a docking with anything, you need a male and a female part so that you actually have a hard dock so that the two vehicles can actually combine enough to, um, to you know, be able to create a tunnel. So the, uh, the, command, uh, the command service and lunar modules did this. The command module was the male and the uh, lunar module was the female. You get a hard dock, take the adapter out, and you have a tunnel, and now you have two spacecraft. So there is this weird story, apparently, that people know that, um, it was like a thing of machismo that because the Apollo has a male docking port and the Soyuz has a male docking port, no one wanted to switch theirs to be the female part because masculinity. That's not a thing that I've ever heard of. What I know about the docking unit, which makes like sense for science, um, is that it was an issue of mixed gas environments. So the Apollo, as we know, used pure oxygen um, under pressure even after the Apollo 1 fire. Well, the Soyuz, the Soviets always used a mixed gas environment. They used oxygen and nitrogen so that it would be less flammable. Now, remember the Soyuz, or the Soyuz, the Soviets rather lost a, a cosmonaut during a training exercise to an oxygen fire. So they learned their lesson, but America did not. Also, it would have been really hard to retrofit all that into Apollo. So the docking adapter was actually built to link the two spacecraft such that you wouldn't have to change the environment in either one for the astronauts to go between them. So I think the way it worked, and I'll have to do a separate video on this. Sorry, we've got we've got visitors now. Um, but is that you could dock it together, and then you could depressurize, or you could pressurize the docking adapter section with one environment, and then that would be kind of your way to move between two spacecraft. You couldn't open it up to both. You had to have this midsection because the environments were different. So that's the story, and here's where we end our quick little tour. So. Apollo Soyuz, also handshake in space. Great story. There will be more Apollo Soyuz videos to come, I promise. All right, thus ends. So, sorry, I should show you guys this like amazing stained glass um, Apollo window behind me, but uh, that ends the tour. My little uh, super quick nerd girl's guide to the uh, Kansas Cosmosphere. It's definitely worth the trip out here if you guys can make it to Hutchinson, Kansas, which admittedly is not the easiest place to get to. It's like an hour drive from Wichita, which is the airport that I flew in here to get here. Um, but totally worth going, it's totally worth it. If you are in the area, it's worth coming out for a day. Um, you probably need half a day to see it, um, but it's kind of awesome. So yeah, I just wanted to show you guys that because some of you guys might not be able to get out here and uh, you should see how awesome this museum is. So thank you guys for dealing with my shaky handheld camera work for another uh, museum tour. Oh yeah, I should do this too. If you guys want to see more of these museum tours, let me know where you would like me to go. I can't promise that I can get there, but if I end up there, I can be sure to do another museum tour. Um, and of course, if you have questions or comments or anything about stuff that you've seen in this video in this museum, let me know. I can look into stuff. I can put up links to videos that I have already for things. Um, and of course, let me know your thoughts and all those things in the comment section down below. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and on Instagram for daily Vintage Space content. Be sure to like this video. And of course, if you would like Vintage Space content every single week, usually more polished, proper videos than this one, I promise. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode.